Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS, a community service of Arizona State University. See this playset? There used to be a pickup truck sitting there, a truck I didn't use and didn't want. So I donated it to public television and they took care of everything. In addition to supporting my favorite programs, I earned a tax deduction. Turn something you don't need into something you really want. Contact the Vehicle Donation Program. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Arizona PBS celebrates a moment in time made possible by the Linkus Group, a registered financial advisor. The Lowell Observatory has uncovered many hidden treasures amongst the stars, from the discovery of Pluto to the rings of Uranus. The observatory has stood the test of time and continues to scan the skies today. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. Washington Week is an island of civil discourse in a chaotic media environment. On Friday night, we gather the best reporters in the nation and have a conversation that's about informing the American people. Washington Week. All new Friday night at 7 on Arizona PBS. From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. The latest on Vice President Mike Pence's visit to the Valley and his meeting with local Hispanic leaders. Plus, how officials and advocates across Arizona are reacting to the Trump administration's newly announced cap on refugees. And a new California bill allowing cities to establish public banks. We'll break down what they are and how they work. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Christopher Lindsay. And I'm Mackenzie Pavasic. Thank you for joining us. Vice President Mike Pence is visiting Arizona and taking credit for job growth among the Hispanic population. He took part in a roundtable with Hispanic leaders and other Republican officials. Reporter Andrew Christensen was at the meeting. Andrew? The vice president was joined by Senator Martha McSally and Governor Doug Ducey to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. His message, the economy is booming, and as a result, Hispanic businesses here in Arizona are growing. A roundtable event with Hispanic leaders at First Baptist Church of Scottsdale began with Mike Pence acknowledging the economic contributions that Hispanic Americans have brought to Arizona. This is a particularly exciting time. Uh, for Hispanic Americans because thanks to the leadership of, of President Trump and our strong allies in the Congress, where we've cut taxes, rolled back regulation on businesses large and small, uh, where we've been able to expand uh, uh, access to American energy, we've launched an energy renaissance. It's yeah, Governor Doug Ducey talked about our population growth. Arizona can brag as one of the fastest growing states in the nation. Maricopa County is the fastest growing county in the country. This is three years running, and Phoenix was just named the fastest growing city in, in the country. Republican Senator Martha McSally followed up by saying that she is particularly proud of the growing number of female Hispanic entrepreneurs. We are a very diverse state, uh, and I've been spending my whole life fighting stereotypes, you know, making generalizations about, you know, groups of people, but the numbers certainly speak for themselves. When Pence was asked about the Trump administration's tactics to win over Hispanic voters in 2020, he said that they hope to remind them about the amount of jobs Trump has created and near historic low unemployment rate. Uh, Hispanic Americans here in Arizona are winning uh, under the policies of President Trump and the policies that Senator Martha McSally has supported and Governor Ducey has advanced in the state. I mean, our economy is growing, our military is stronger than ever before. Business leaders in attendance also seem to favor Pence's message. We felt very heard. We felt that we could express our concerns and, and also, you know, make um, requests that... Pence's message before leaving spoke to Hispanic heritage. The values that this administration has stood for, of faith and family and the sanctity of life and freedom, those are all values that are synonymous with the Hispanic American community. 
After this event, Vice President Pence is headed to Tucson for a speech on the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement and then headed back to D.C., but he says this won't be his last visit here. He plans on spending a lot of time in Arizona. In the Broadcast Center, Andrew Christensen, Cronkite News. While Pence was in Arizona, the investigation of his boss was gaining steam back in Washington. House committees pressing an impeachment inquiry of President Donald Trump met today for a day of closed-door testimony. First up was McCain Institute director Kurt Volker, who resigned as special envoy to Ukraine after his name surfaced in a whistleblower's report. That report said Trump asked Ukrainian officials to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden, a potential Trump rival, and Volker helped set up meetings between the Ukrainians and the White House. Volker's deposition began at 9 a.m. and expected to go well into the evening, with more hearings expecting next week. There are a lot of things we take for granted in the city that may not be a given in rural areas. And that's especially true in tribal areas where sparse populations and long distances make adequate roads and inter infrastructure, excuse me, a challenge. That includes the delivery of broadband service, a problem that was a topic of conversation in Washington recently. Cronkite News reporter Hannah Ehrlich has the story from our DC Bureau. Officials at the National Tribal Broadband Summit hoped to find answers, but first, they had some questions. Who has access? How do we get access? Who owns it? What's the path forward? Senator McSally was just one of the speakers at last week's summit, which brought together business leaders, lawmakers, and officials from the Education Department and Federal Communications Commission. They all agreed that a lack of access to broadbands is more than just an inconvenience in rural areas. Whether it's access to education, uh, whether it's access to transformational health care delivery, uh, there are so many opportunities now that technology brings to our lives in order to increase our livelihood, uh, improve our lives, save our lives. Uh, and if tribal communities don't have access to this, uh, then they're going to be continually left behind. One way to deal with that is the FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which will dedicate $20 billion to the issue over 10 years. So they have these these kind of reserve USF funds or this excess amount of, uh, of universal service funds, and, and what they're doing now, they're saying, okay, so they have they have collected enough funding that they're going to provide an incentive. That incentive will be money from the fund to help companies provide broadband in rural areas where it would not otherwise be profitable. The two-day summit will not be the end of this discussion, as the FCC continues to look for companies to support rural areas. And so rural tribal areas, they are in the most desperate need of needing uh, additional funding to try to get broadband out to basically the most economically depressed areas of the United States. So uh, the FCC, the record is clear. Um, they're trying to do the right thing. It's just, it, you know, it all takes a little bit of time. In Washington, Hannah Ehrlich, Cronkite News. Maricopa has his first female county attorney. Alistair Adele was appointed to the position this morning. She replaces Bill Montgomery, who was appointed to the Arizona Supreme Court. Officials say Adele is the first woman to serve in that position, though another woman held the post on an interim basis after Montgomery's resignation. Earlier in her career, Adele worked as a prosecutor, administrative law judge, and general counsel for the Arizona Department of Child Safety. Adele attended ASU's Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law. Last week, the Trump administration announced they'd be capping the number of refugees allowed into the U.S. for the fiscal year 2020 at 18,000. This number represents a historic low, prompting local community activists and lawmakers to denounce the new policy. Cronkite News reporter Frankie McLister was with the activists as they explained what they described as devastating to the refugee community. Frankie? This coalition of organizations and advocacy group condemned what they see as a racist rhetoric and policy changes on behalf of the administration. They argue refugees are most among vulnerable of migrants, as many as escaping wars, extreme poverty, and violence. Welcome. Earlier in this, during an event earlier this afternoon at the state capitol, Faith Leaders Arizona Refugee resettlement agencies, state lawmakers from both parties, and refugees themselves coming together united for this cause. 
Arizona has historically been one of the nation's states that's welcomed the most amount of refugees. Now that could change after this new decision on behalf of the federal government. Those at today's gathering also spoke about the negative impacts change in policies have had on TPS holders and asylum seekers. On the other hand, Acting Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services Ken Cuccinelli says the reduction is necessary to maintain the integrity of the program and the safety of the United States. When you see somebody who's, you know, needing shelter, needing refuge during their most vulnerable time, our reaction as Americans should be to help them out, not to turn them away. Most of the employers, we used to call employers, beg them to hire, place some refugees. Now they call us, please bring the refugees. We don't have any. Security comes first. Our entire immigration system, including the humanitarian piece, is for the benefit of America and Americans and its strategic goals. And for its part, the State Department released a statement regarding the new refugee cap number, saying in part, quote, the mission of American diplomacy is more important than ever, and diplomatic tools are essential to resolve the crisis points that drive displacement in the first place, end quote. Frankie McClister, Cronkite News. California, Gover California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill into law yesterday that permits the operation of public banks in the state. California now joins North Dakota as the only states in the country to allow them. So what is a public bank? The concept might sound strange, but public banks don't operate all that differently from commercial ones. Essentially, a public bank is a financial institution owned and operated by a government. California's plan allows for up to 10 cities or counties to establish banks. These banks would be able to loan money for things like infrastructure projects, education, and small businesses like a normal bank would. And like any government-owned institution, the bank is funded with your tax dollars. These banks will be run by an independent board of directors appointed by the city and, like any other bank, insured through the FDIC. There are advantages to public banks, like lower interest rates or on loans, but critics are concerned that they may not be as efficient and could be subject to political influence. Officials say the process for starting up the first public bank in the state could take one to two years. And coming up on Cronkite News at 5, the dangers of vaping. Researchers at the Mayo Clinic getting closer to un <laughs> uncovering what's causing lung damage. We'll tell you what they found so far. And more than one in three Americans suffer from pre-diabetes, with many not even realizing it. We'll take a look at how this serious health condition is affecting Arizonans. Cronkite Noticias is the Spanish-speaking division of Cronkite News, covering topics such as economics, education, sustainability, immigration, and border relations. Cronkite Noticias strives to serve the Spanish-speaking community in Arizona. Under the guidance of prominent Spanish-speaking professionals, students at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism develop content for our broadcast partner, Univision, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Explore Cronkite Noticias at cronkitenoticias.azpbs.org. Stay in the know, on the go. At Cronkite News, we work hard to report the facts and keep you updated, whether we're on set or on the scene. Taking it from the studio to the field. So I'm here in South Phoenix. In Phoenix, we're just a click away. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. A new study out today by the Mayo Clinic is the first in the nation to examine lung tissue from people with vaping-related illnesses. The results are helping researchers narrow down the exact type of harm vaping may cause. The study examined 17 samples of lung tissue. All of the patients had vaped, with 71% of them vaping with cannabis oil. Two of the patients who contributed samples later died. What we see with these vaping cases is a kind of severe chemical injury that I've never seen before in a tobacco smoker or a traditional marijuana smoker. Uh, but I, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Over 800 cases of lung injuries linked to vaping have been reported for, to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention over the last few months. 
It's a condition that sometimes doesn't show symptoms, but when people develop it, it's very dangerous and can even be fatal. Jody Guerrero explains diabetes and what you can do to prevent it. You feel like, uh, you feel really ugly, you feel fat, you feel unhealthy. Marsha Angulo says her life changed three years ago when she was diagnosed with diabetes. She's one of more than 30 million Americans who have diabetes, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But before crossing the line to diabetes, there is a condition called prediabetes. Data from the CDC indicates that about 84 million American adults have it, and 90 percent of them don't know. They have abnormal result of glucose on their blood test. According to the CDC, fasting blood glucose levels from 100 to 125 indicates prediabetes. Levels from 126 or above indicates type 2 diabetes. Less than 100 means you don't have the condition. Hispanics have more than a 50% chance of developing diabetes at a younger age. Dr. Mahmoud Al-Sayed from Banner University Medical Center explains the risk factors. Sometimes also it can be environmental, sometimes be cultural, diet, exercise, lifestyle. But there are programs to help address this, like the ones at St. Vincent de Paul's Center of Family Wellness. They learn about healthy eating, physical activity, but then how to actually plan to take into action those lessons that they're learning, as well as we talk about the social emotional part of it. This is the insulin I have to put right now. Angulo understands that oh, yeah, the disease yeah. is linked to mental health and conditions like depression and anxiety. That is the reason she created a blog called Diabetes. So I started sharing motivation that helped me. Um, so that's how I started, just like sharing things that helped me uh, to help others. Health authorities recommend people with a higher risk get screened every year. And the general population should get checked every three years. And after the break, California's new bill allowing college athletes to get paid is turning the sports world upside down. See what the ASU head football coach had to say about it right after this. Girls, it's October 3rd. I'll tell you up next what you can expect this weekend and what you can do for fun. Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. Welcome to another edition of Cronkite Sports Now. I'm Taylor Rocha. Let's talk sports. For the latest on local sports and beyond, we've got you covered. Let's do this thing. We challenge reporters to go beyond you know, a game story. We want stories with depth. It's just a really a crucial step from the college um, experience into the professional experience while you're still in school. At Cronkite Sports Now, watch the journalists of tomorrow cover sports today. On Monday, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a law into existence allowing college athletes to benefit off of their likeness. This has caused a stir across the country, including right here in Arizona. Cronkite News reporter Matthew Roy has reaction from those in the Valley of the Sun. Thank you, Chris. Paying college athletes has been a conversation for years. But recently, it's picked up a lot more steam. With California passing this bill on Monday, key Arizonans are still split on the fact, are still split on the impact that this will have on collegiate athletics. Arizona State head football coach Herm Edwards said before the pay-to-play bill was signed that it would equate to an unequal playing field. It'll give the California schools an advantage in recruiting, to be quite honest. I think you're opening Pandora's box. One key that was said by Newsom and NBA star LeBron James on Monday was that it would help athletes that come from impoverished areas to make some money while also getting their education, and Edwards agrees. And for a lot of these young men um, or women that are student athletes, according to where they come from, that's important to them. You know, I can make extra money. 
I get extra benefits. However, for current college athletes like ASU running back Eno Benjamin, he isn't really concerned with this law much because, well, it won't really affect him. Uh, really, I'm sort of indifferent. I see the sides, I see pros and I see cons. And so, um, that's not for me um, to um, decide. But many have been saying, It's going to change college football, big time. But Victoria Jackson, a former ASU national champion track and field star and now sports historian and ASU professor, has different thoughts. You know, there's a, a lot of concerns and fear mongering that the whole thing is going to change fundamentally, but I don't think it's going to change all that much. There have been statements this week from both the NCAA and the Pac-12 conference on the signing of this bill, but this line from the Pac-12 on how it will adversely affect women's sports has Jackson up in arms. If they cared about women's sports, they'd be doing more to encourage women to stay in coaching. If they cared about women's sports, they wouldn't count men who practice with women's teams as women for Title IX compliance. I mean, it's, it's just so tired. It's disingenuous and it's really frustrating. Legislation is continuously being discussed nationwide, but Jackson thinks something will get done before California's law takes effect in 2023. In the Media Center, Matthew Roy, Cronkite News. You've got just a couple more weeks left to take advantage of the services available at the Grand Canyon's North Rim. That's because the park will begin reducing services for the cold season starting October 16th. This includes everything from the lodge and restaurants to the trails and shower facilities. Just one gift shop and gas station will offer limited services until May of next year. And for those of you planning vacations up north this winter, don't worry. The canyon's mo more popular South Rim stays open all year round. And as we move toward that cold season in October, Annika, I think we can all say we've enjoyed the cool down in the weather. What can we expect this weekend? It's going to be an absolutely gorgeous weekend. And to top it off, there's some really fun events going on around the valley. So let me share that with you. Right now in the Phoenix area, it's sitting just at 94 degrees and 90s for really the whole valley. Up north, we have some stubborn holdouts here. Flagstaff is sitting at 68, just below 70 degrees. If we take a look at our evening, though, it's clear size, beautiful all night long. We reach just 82 degrees at the low here of the evening. But looking at tomorrow, it's not much different. Temperatures are creeping up ever so slightly, not too much. Probably the uh, biggest difference here is the Grand Canyon is 73 degrees. Yuma is 95, almost 100, even though we've been close to out of those triple digits lately. This weekend, we have some really fun events coming up in two opening weekends. The Arizona State Fair is opening this weekend with that 150-foot Ferris wheel. Beautiful skies, corn maze, and pumpkin days. Pick out your perfect Halloween pumpkin. And, of course, Phoenix Fashion Week. But if we go into the weekend, it's beautiful and sunny. If you go to the pumpkin patch, go in the morning. It's going to be a lot cooler. And into the rest of the week, it is sunny all week long. If you go to the fair, wear your 10-gallon hat. Be prepared to protect yourself from the sun. I'm Annika Abbott here in the Cronkite News Weather Center. Still ahead, how can companies all over the world reduce their impact on the environment? We'll show you a local brewery's answer to that when we come back. And it may surprise you. With wildfires, a scarcity of water, and other environmental issues facing the Earth today, it's critical to stay up to date with local impacts of a changing climate. That's why we created Elemental Covering Sustainability, a multimedia collaboration between public television and radio stations. From climate change to water conservation to renewable energy and much more, Elemental covers the latest in sustainability news. Find our stories on our website, elementalreports.com.
at Cronkite News, we have producers who craft shows that make an impact on our community. Our broadcasts allow students to be involved in all levels of production, from producing to directing. We are guided by highly respected professionals who mentor the journalists of tomorrow. From technical directing to teleprompting and beyond, our production crew works tirelessly to produce meaningful and award-winning shows. We are Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Before Professor Halden, I had an insane amount of passion, but I almost felt helpless because I didn't know how to use it. Professor Halden gave me a chance to make a difference. Being at a place like ASU allows you to take these big leaps. Ultimately, the biggest problems in the world cannot be solved alone. Scottsdale Water has been doing what's called indirect potable reuse of water for over 20 years, but now Scottsdale is eligible for direct potable reuse. This means they can serve recycled water directly for human consumption. Delaney White has more about how the water is being used. Though this water will not be put directly into the distribution systems for homes and businesses, a local brewery is using the water in an attempt to change public perception. All water has a history. What's really important is how that water is treated and how that water is tested. The City of Scottsdale's Water Resources Division received a permit for direct potable reuse of water, meaning the treatment of recycled water is safe for people to drink. But even though it's safe, the department will not be putting the water directly into homes. But one brewery says it's great for beer. Here at Walter Station Brewery, they are now adding recycled water to their beer in order to change public perception. Owner and brewer James Erickson explained the process behind turning this recycled water into beer. They are delivering that and we're putting it into uh, our hot liquor tank, which is the, the first uh, vessel or tank that we use, which supplies water for the entire brewing process. So what you've seen earlier is them basically uh, rigging up a hose with a pump system so that they can pump the water that they brought into our equipment so that we can use it for brewing. Erickson explained why this practice of sustainability is so important for not only his business, but for people everywhere. In a brewery where the product that we produce is over 95% water, uh, obviously water is going to be really important to us. Uh, it is a resource that we use more than anything else. And uh, so obviously it's very important. Uh, and it's, it's really important that we develop sustainable practices so that we have water to come or to use for years to come. Owner James Erickson said quality control checks have detected no discernible differences in the taste of the beer. In the broadcast center, Delaney White, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, a new effort to provide health care to underserved populations regardless of their ability to pay. And we'll hear from the actor playing legendary boxer Jack Johnson, Arizona Theater Company's opening show. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, Democrats threaten to subpoena the White House as the impeachment inquiry enters a new phase. Coming up after Cronkite News and Arizona Horizon on Arizona PBS. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thank you for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Next time on A Chef's Life. Here they come. There's your fish. Oh, cool. I'll have a special connection to these. There you go. We're doing a Feast of the Seven Fishes dinner. So we'll start plating now, and we'll help run it up. Being back at the restaurant, that ain't no joke. Tonight at 7.30 on Arizona PBS. For the past eight months, we've been delighted to bring my show, Amanpour, to PBS. Now.